The last time I had a panic attack, I was worrying about school. Classes were very hard at the time. I all of a sudden just kind of broke. I mean, panic attacks are scary. I can't breathe for like a minute. Well, actually it feels like like an hour. After I'm done, my body just feels very just weak and sore. When they get very bad, I want to call an ambulance because I feel like I actually can't move or breathe or think about anything else. And everyone else is kind of freaking out. And so it just builds on. I do have warning signs, but it's, it's always still, it feels like it's happened for the first time. It does cause me more panic knowing that it is about to happen. A lot of things trigger panic attacks. I always think of the worst possible thing. Try not to think about them, but it's very hard. I sometimes take my dog out during the day, and I feel like someone is going to hurt me. Car accidents like worry me a lot. Going through an intersection, I just, most of the time I have to close my eyes. School is very stressful for me, getting good grades. I think in my eyes that all of this is happening because like I'm weak. A lot of people deal with stress and why can't I do it? Right there, you heard a teen's view of panic and having a panic attack. And that is our topic for today. Welcome to Dear Anxiety. We're the show about mental health, about how people deal with their thoughts and feelings. I, my heart goes out to her and goes out to any person, and I certainly relate to it. And in fact, our co-host uh, coming up here very shortly uh, relates to it very personally. So we have a lot to talk about today. We want to help people. We want to explore uh, panic, what's behind it, and how how we can deal with it in a, in a new way, a different way. So buckle up. I'm Ed Krasnick, and my partner, Rini Jane, is coming up in just a second, um, and I've been nervous about this for a week. I don't know if it, what I'm having is exactly panic, but I am experiencing some tightness and, some, and also a problem with my chest. We'll talk about that later. Um, right now, I, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce... Now, my partner is an expert in applied positive psychology, and thank God she is. She has a master's degree from the University of Pennsylvania in applied positive psychology. She is the founder, the chief storyteller of GoZen.com. And GoZen teaches resilience skills and happiness skills and anxiety relief, anger transformation, all kinds of things that you need for living to kids and parents all over the world through animation. So you can go to GoZen.com and find out more. But here she is. Rini Jane. And Rini, welcome to our Panic theme park. This is Six Flags Over Panic. Ride all day. Welcome. Oh, my goodness. I lived here. I, I lived here for many, many, many years. It's been a while. Yeah, I'm not glad to be back. This is a little, I was almost reticent to, to sort of talk to you about this, but I guess, I guess that's the whole point of it, right, is, is talking to it and exploring it. But you wouldn't probably, you probably wouldn't be doing any of this work if it weren't for an experience that you had a while ago. So tell, tell, share a little bit about this, this, how you got here. My goodness. You know, from ages eight to maybe like 24, 25, I pretended like everything was just fine. Have you ever done that before? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for about 50 years. Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Oh, how are you? Fine. How's school? Fine. Tests? Fine. Everything's fine. Nothing is fine, obviously, right? <laughs> Good Not one thing sticker. is fine. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. If you're too close to read this, nothing is fine. So what happens to you when you pretend like everything is okay, yet inside you are chronically worried, you're sad, you're jealous, you're angry, you have human emotions that you don't acknowledge and you run away from and you quash them and you squash them and you ignore them and you deny them, you stockpile them essentially. And when you pile up all of these feelings inside and you never release them, well, eventually your body just shuts you down. And that's what mine did. 
So what happened was I had graduated from college. I, in you know, one part of my life, I was pretty functional. So I was already running my own business in my early 20s. And uh, I was in a bad relationship at the same time. Okay, so I went through a breakup and I walked into my office one day and I passed everyone that worked with me and I went straight into this private bathroom that I had and I fell on the ground and I clutched my chest because I was in intense pain. And this was a real pain, right? Not some phantom pain. And I had extreme shortness of breath <sighs> like that, you know, hmm. the kind that even when you hear someone else having it, it panics you. It's contagious. So I didn't want anyone to know what I was going through because that's who I was. It was all about putting on a happy face. And I drove myself to the emergency room. And I already knew the doctor there because I had been there before. And he said, you're back. And I said, listen, I am having a heart attack right now as we speak. You need to check me. And he said, how old are you again? And I said, 24. And he just looked at me and he's like, okay, I'll run the tests comes back. You're not having a heart attack. You had a massive panic attack and you need to change your life. And it was literally, if you've ever hit rock bottom before, Ed or anyone else yes. <laughs> out there. Yes. yes. And you have, sometimes the moment of clarity comes later. Like, oh, that was rock bottom. For me, it was right then and there. This is the lowest of low that I have ever been in my life. Because on the outside, I had everything, you know, I had a college degree, I had a job, I was in a relationship, my family is great. What is wrong with you? Why are you panicking? And why are you full of anxiety? So I knew at that point that this is this is it. Things have to change. I have to take the mask off. And so I went to therapy. And that was the greatest gift of my life. Because I had this therapist, and I swear he looked like Freud. <laughs> <laughs> he maybe was Freud. <laughs> maybe he was, <laughs> yeah. right? Reincarnated. Mm -hmm. And he was kind of, you know, had his hand on his beard. And he was telling me, listen, these feelings are human. And he was like, they are? <laughs> Just allow them. Allow them to rise up. Allow them to be and don't try to change them. And I just had this epiphany. Right. And I, we've talked about this before, but just this clarity. I'm like, excuse me. But if I had known this when I was the eight year old version of myself, the trajectory of my life would have been very different. It was the moment of change for me where everything changed and the real work of my life began. But yeah, I had massive panic attacks. Have you yeah. ever had panic attacks, Ed? You, you know, Rini, that's funny because that's what I wanted to ask you is, you know, this has become almost like a catchphrase now, almost like OCD it has been a catchphrase where we hear about it a lot and people will say, oh my God, what a crazy day I'm having. I'm, I'm like having a panic attack today. What is the difference between having a panic attack and feeling just panicky about something? Yes. You know, it's so funny because we do use these words in every day. I mean, people use the words or the acronym OCD all the time. I'm so OCD or I'm such a perfectionist, right? Or I'm yeah. panicking, right? I'm having a panic attack over this. If you're able to clearly say that you're having a panic attack over something <laughs> very clearly like that, you know, in that voice, you're probably not having a panic attack. Panic attacks have a very sudden onset typically. Typically, you feel like they come out of the blue without warning, right? They can strike at any time. You can be driving, you could be sleeping, you could be in the middle of a meeting. I know that some of you may have seen Dan Harris, who's written a book. He was in the middle of a news broadcast. He had a panic attack. But it comes on and it's extremely intense and it has extremely intense physical symptoms, right? So a pounding heart, sweating, trembling, shortness of breath hot flashes, nauseous, chest pain. So if you've ever felt kind of the butterflies in your stomach before you give a speech, that's a symptom. But a panic attack is sudden. It's extremely intense. It can last anywhere from 10 minutes to maybe, you know, an hour on the very high end. But that's a panic attack. You would know it if you saw it. And it's usually very physical. 
There's a lot of physical stuff going on. A lot of times when kids are having a panic attack, they feel like they're dying. So, and excuse me for saying that for those of you who are listening, right? I'm um, not saying that to trigger anything. It's the feeling that they have. Oh my goodness. And it's why I ran myself to the emergency room. I literally thought I was having a heart attack because you are having physical pain. This is the kind of chemicals that pours through your body that when it's working for you, it gives you hysterical strength. And what I mean by that is that, you know, you hear those stories about there's a woman named Angela and her son was fixing his car and the jack fell out, right? He was underneath the car and the car fell on top of him. And Angela, the mom, all of a sudden had a surge of hormones in her body and she was able to lift the 3,000 pound car up where she wouldn't have been able to do that before. So a lot of people know like you get a surge of adrenaline along with a lot of other hormones. But when those things are kind of working for you and then you lift up, you know, you lift the car up, I mean, you've used the chemicals that are running through your body. But if you're just kind of standing there and you have these chemicals coursing through your body, because essentially your body's having a false alarm, well, then you have a physical reaction, right? Your stomach right. starts to hurt. You have that chest pain. You have headaches. You can have dizziness. You can have numbness. Right. But to answer your question, you would know if you're having, a, I mean, most people know when they're having a panic attack because they have extremely visible physical symptoms. And Ed, can you give the little disclaimer about us not being doctors? Wait, Ed, are you a doctor? I am a doctor. Uh, <laughs> a, I'm doctor a doctor of what? I, I'm, I'm Dr. Panic is what they call me. <laughs> um, and, 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 and anyway, this is, this is the thing. We're not doctors. We're not, we, we don't, we're not surgeons. We're not psychics. We're not any of these things. We're human beings just like you who are listening. But there's something that I want to say, because I'm starting to pick up really recurring themes in our show, Rini. And one of the recurring themes is that generally we don't talk to our feelings or our thoughts. Generally, not, this is not all people, but most people, I would say, tend to ignore, not listen to, run away from, suppress, and resist their feelings and thoughts for various reasons. One is that we're not taught how to do it differently. Two is that we're taught other things like feelings and thoughts are harmful and they can hurt you and they're painful. And here's the thing that I'm starting to realize even at my age, and I'm 1,500 years old tomorrow. Uh, I'm using a moisturizer, so I, lo I don't look a day over 1,499. But I will, I will tell you that what is painful is actually the opposite of what we are what we have learned. What's painful is resisting. Feelings and thoughts are not painful. Resisting them is painful. Just like trying to hold back just like being in the Hoover Dam and trying to hold back water, it takes a herculean amount of effort and energy to hold back what is natural. And what is natural is to have feelings and thoughts. Yes, 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 absolutely. So this idea of resistance, I think, is so big. I mean, feelings and thoughts, I think that you might get some people arguing that, hey, the feelings and thoughts can be painful. But what I would say also is that while maybe they feel painful, that there's an additional layer of suffering that goes on when we try to resist them instead of trying to pass through them. Yeah, there's a temp there's a temporary nature to feeling to feelings and thoughts. There's energy, there's an energy happening and it's very temporary compared to pushing something down, trying to run away from it, trying to avoid it, thinking that you're a bad person That's for having it. That's a full-time job. It's a full-time job. It's and a full-time job. Go Pretending a is a full-time job. Yes. Yeah, it is. And it can go on for a many, many years. And sometimes it goes on for an entire lifetime and it doesn't have to. It is literally also the way to end the panic cycle. When you are pretending like everything is okay, right? And then you are resisting when everything is not okay, that just perpetuates what's going on. And we can completely dig into that if you want to. Sure. Now then let's talk about, uh, so I don't know if that's a science thing or is, is there some function to panic? Is it trying to tell us something? Is, it, is, is there something that can be, is there a benefit to it at all? 
So listen, again, you know, we were talking about where you could have the need to have this hysterical strength. I mean, most of the time we're not running into a saber tooth cat. By the way, someone, did I tell you this, that it's not saber tooth tiger, it's saber tooth cat? <laughs> I didn't know that. I always say no, tiger. Okay, no, anyway. Conceptions. Yes. My life based on. Yes. Like, see the fun facts that you get when you listen to Dear Anxiety. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> um. So, you know, most of us are not running into some kind of impending danger when we're going to the grocery store on to on the way to work and we don't need this we don't need this hysterical strength to have the fight, flight or freeze response. And so that's what we need it for, right? That's what you need panic for. You need panic if your house is on fire and you need to run out the door, right? You need to flee. You need panic if you need to fight something that is endangering you or threatening something threatening you. But what happens is that when you have panic, it's so incredibly uncomfortable that it feels like something is terribly wrong. Something is going terribly wrong inside of your body. And as I said, I used to say to myself, and I've heard many kids that I work with say, I felt like I was going to die or I feel like I'm going to die when it happens. That's intense. If you have the feeling that this is the end of your life, there's not much more intensity than that. Absolutely. So it doesn't serve you to obviously have it and feel like you're going to die and then think that something is wrong. But where you have control, because, in, you know, earlier we said that sometimes it comes, oftentimes a panic attack can come without warning and it can happen suddenly. It can happen at any time. And so where things get really difficult is that people feel like they are out of control so they begin to avoid the things, the places, and the associations that they have with a place that, where they've had a panic attack. So I was talking about how I had a panic attack in my office. And so if I remained in the cycle of panic, which we're going to talk about the cycle in a little bit, then I would start to say, well, I had a panic attack in that bathroom in the office, so maybe I should just stay away from that bathroom. And eventually, I begin to avoid more things. Well, you know what? Maybe I should just completely avoid the office altogether. So there's actually a lot of superstition involved in a lot of avoidance when it comes to panic, because obviously we don't want to have a panic attack. It feels terrible. And right. so we're completely trying to avoid it. The, these things like panic, like anxiety, worry, body image, whatever it is, we feel like we're isolated. And that is the thing that makes all of this really difficult to transcend and to explore emotions and thoughts. You feel like you're isolated. There's no one else experiencing these things. And we're actually telling ourselves, and when I say we, I'm talking about me, I'm telling myself that I'm isolated, that I'm, no one else is out there. And if I were telling, weren't telling myself that, I wouldn't feel as isolated, first of all. And if you're listening right now, this is every human being on the planet. You are not only aren't you al not alone, you're with every human being on the planet. Isolate gasp worthy. <gasps> it's human. It's natural. Other people go through this. Go back to now we're going to go back to talk again about about the cycle mm -hmm. and about science a little bit. Yeah, let's let's get a little bit into the science because the science is so interesting. So I'm going to talk about the cycle of panic, what happens when you have a panic attack and why it's a cycle. And usually when you see cycles demonstrated on paper, it's like a circle, right? With some arrows, something happens with an arrow to the next thing that leads to the next thing. So that's how you can visualize it if you're listening to us right now. And we will also provide this cycle in writing for you if you visit gozen.com forward slash dear anxiety. Under this episode, you'll have a little PDF of this cycle. Okay, so here's the cycle of panic. This is what happens. So you have a panic attack. In this cycle, we call it F cubed, which is the fight, flight, or freeze response. It's what everyone visualizes as a panic attack, right? When you're having that, you're clutching your chest, you're having that shortness of breath, you're having the actual panic attack. That's the beginning of the cycle. So then what happens is you actually get through the panic attack because guess what? Never in the history of mankind... And again, we're not doctors, so you can check on this. But never in the history of mankind has anyone died from a panic attack, unless there's some other underlying medical issue that's going on. If you just have a panic attack, you get through it. You feel like you're not going to get through it, but you get through it. 
What happens after you have the panic attack and you get through it, because while you're having the panic attack, while you're having these physical things happen to you, you are also having these thoughts. And the thoughts are like, I feel like something very bad is happening. I feel like something's going wrong. I feel like I'm going to die. I feel like you have feel likes, feel like thoughts going through your head. But none of those things actually come to be. Very few of them. I feel like everyone's looking at me. I feel like I'm a pariah. I feel like this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. I feel like I'm going to die again, right? So you do a lot of feel liking. So that's the next part of the cycle. Once you get through the panic attack and none of those feel likes happen, then you start to say, well, I got th- you get you got through it, right? So you start to do something I call fillerizing. This is rationalizing, essentially. Oh, well, that was a really bad thing that happened and I felt like I was going to die. But guess what? I didn't I actually got through it and I didn't actually die from that panic attack because and then you fillerize and you in fillerizing you basically make up a reason. I was holding my lucky charm, my rabbit's foot, you know, mm-hmm. and that's why. Oh, it's because so and so, you know, called me in for the meeting and then I was able to get up and I didn't or oh, I just got saved by just like a little bit. And next time is going to be the time where things go wrong. So you make up a reason why you survived it. So then the next part of the cycle is after you haven't had a panic attack for a while, you start to worry about the next one. You start to fear having to feel that again. Oh my goodness, what if that happens again? What if I fall down to the floor and my chest hurts like that again? What if I get the chills and the hot flashes and I'm nauseous and the cramping and it's painful. What if that happens again? So you go into what if fearing mode. I call it fearing the feels because fearing the feeling that you had. And because of that fear, you start to do what I call fortifying behaviors. And this fortifies the cycle. These are behaviors that are not good. And they all have to do essentially with avoidance. I'm not going to go to the office. I'm not going to be near that bathroom. I'm not going to go to school if that's where I had a panic attack. I'm going to avoid doing this. And actually, a lot of agoraphobia, people who are afraid to leave their homes, is caused by panic. I'm just going to stay home because this is the safest place I can be. This keeps you locked into the cycle. And that's when you might have the next panic attack, right? Because you're in a cycle and the cycle goes round and round and round until you break it. Wow, that is incredible. Very powerful and a lot of work. We're doing a lot of work there. That's like the kind of work you could take over a country if you turn that around. The kind of strategy that goes into this. It's a lot of energy. Tremendous energy is being spent trying to survive this thing. That's such a good point. You spend your whole life in the cycle. It takes so much time and thought and effort and, yeah, strategy. You're right. And it's a lot of strategy. And 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 we do this. I mean, we're talking about panic, but this is these are this is with a lot of feelings. This is with anger. This is with uh, guilt. This is with sadness. This is with happy. It's every. This is an emotional thing that we do with our emotions and thoughts. We happen to be talking about a very extreme thing, but in some ways we do it with our thoughts and feelings all the time and we practice it many, many times. You are so right. Imagine getting into, so if, if you get into an argument with your spouse or your partner or your mate or your roommate or whomever, and you don't want to have to deal with it, you avoid it. How yes. can I avoid that person completely so I don't have to confront it? And it's exactly what you're saying. It is the same thing with us inside of our bodies. How do I avoid feeling this? I will do everything in my power to avoid facing it. And that's what we're practicing. We think we're doing it by default, but we're actually practicing avoidance. And that's why it seems so strange to actually be aware of and face anything. Because by default, it seems like we're practicing avoidance because it makes it that's more comfortable to do. So tell us, what are some of the things that that people can do and some of the things that they can do easily, any day, any time, 
where they can actually start to deal with uh, panic, thoughts of panic, um, you know, bringing these kinds of things on. What can we, what can we, what do we do? So I'm going to explain to you a tiny bit of science, and then I'm going to explain to you a simple trick. Okay. There is a neuroscientist named Joseph Ledoux. He's amazing. Uh, Decades ago, he is the one who really did research on the fear center in the brain. And often we focus on one part of the brain called the amygdala, right? So these almond-shaped structures inside of your brain that basically he called the fear center. So he said, if you are being attacked by a bear, your amygdala would activate And because he called it the fear center, everybody believed that that's why you feel fear, right? My amygdala activates and I feel the feeling of fear. So a couple of years ago, I think it was actually in 2015, he wrote another book. And I have so much respect for him because his work was so seminal in the field that people based interventions after it. Pharmaceutical companies made pharmaceuticals based on this idea, right, of trying to inhibit the amygdala from reacting this way. He said, "Uh, I made a mistake. I should have never called it the fear center. That was not the right thing to call it. Because I called it the fear center, everybody thought that that's why you feel fear. So he said, what I should have done, and this sounds like semantics, right? But he said, what I should have done is called it the threat center. Because listen, when your heart starts beating rapidly, when you see that bear and you start sweating, it's involuntary. You can't help it, right? It's not like you're controlling that. It just happens. And so the threat center is involuntary. But fear is the interpretation of what your body is doing and your mind is doing. Fear, the feeling, is conscious. It's a conscious choice. And so what I can tell you, because that's kind of deep, okay, is that think of it this way. Have you ever been to a scary movie, Ed, in a movie theater? Uh, Yes, yes, I have. Okay, so you've been to a scary movie. And have you ever gotten scared in a good scary movie? Uh, Yes. Okay. So you have been scared in, you know, let's say a horror movie or a thriller. Have you ever felt like while you were watching that movie in the movie theater that your life was in danger? No. No. Okay. This is the difference that I'm talking about. Your mind, your conscious mind has interpreted that experience as safe, even though your heart might be beating and you might be sweating or you might scream out because your threat center got activated while you were watching the movie. You consciously know that you're fine. You're in a movie theater. Like you're not right. in danger. Okay. Well, I was on a date once that was particularly dan, but I'm going to talk about that now. <laughs> We won't talk about that right now. Not now. No. now not <laughs> so that time. might be fear. So what I'm saying to you is that one of the ways out of panic, one of the most powerful ways out of this cycle is your mindset and your interpretation of what is going on with your body when you're experiencing panic. And kids can do this because I work with kids all the time and they're able to understand this. That basically when you have a panic attack, it's a false alarm. Of course, see your pediatrician, make sure it's panic attacks, right? If you have learned that these are panic attacks, then the one line that can get you through the panic attack when you're having it is this. This is uncomfortable, but it's not dangerous. This is uncomfortable, what my body's experiencing, but it's not dangerous. So you wanted something something kind of quick, something easy to remember, that is it. Don't turn away from it. Don't try to run away from it. Don't try to quash it. Don't try to pretend it's not there. Just to know that your body is experiencing a false alarm and it's uncomfortable, but it's not dangerous. You're not in danger. The feelings in the stomach, the feelings in the heart, the sweating, all of that stuff, uncomfortable, but not dangerous. 
So that is that is a huge thing in terms of just awareness. And that you know what I have to say that goes for that goes for panic. It goes for a lot of intense feelings and a lot of intense thoughts. You can say that to yourself about anything because we perceive that things are dangerous, but the thought and the interpretation and the feeling of things that are going on in your daily life that that you interpret cause fear and panic and all kinds of other feelings. And it's not the feel; it's the interpretation. So not in, knowing that you're not in danger from a thought and feeling and even saying it to yourself right away is going to change your life, I feel. It really is. It's such a key when it comes to, it doesn't even have to be panic, as you said. If you're feeling stress, turn into it, turn toward it. Don't turn away from it because it's trying to send you, especially those kinds of emotions that are not panic, right? Panic might not be trying to send you a message aside from you're having a false alarm, but stress, anger, negativity, sadness, guilt, all of these things are sending messages. We just need to turn toward them and listen to what they are saying. And the first step in that is not being scared of our own body because the body's having a reaction to the emotion, to the feeling, right? The body reacts first. And most times we're scared of the body because we live in a neck up world where we like to think about things and really evaluate our thoughts and work there. And we don't like to work with the body, but that's the first place where the signal comes in. Also, another thing is, whatever this is, it's temporary. It's not permanent. It's temporary. Because that's the, fir- that's the other thing that sort of seals it in. And it happens to me all the time. I tell myself the words, it's always going to be like this. It's never going to change. It's always going to, and that's how you can tell. You get the words never and always that you're telling yourself. So important. So important. This too shall pass. Yeah. Yes. So it, and and, and of course, if you don't, if you're not aware and you're not able to tell yourself those kinds of things, or even just, this is what I'm experiencing now, whatever it is, then what happens is, it starts to build, like you mentioned the phrase stockpiling, is it builds up and it becomes stronger. And then it feels insurmountable. It feels like there's no way I have to avoid this. I don't have any other choice. It's too big. This is why we use characters in our programs, because we want kids to see that those feelings have a voice and that voice wants to be heard. In terms of panic, we call the character Trixie and Trixie wants to be heard. And Whittle the Worrier wants to be heard and Fury, who's angry, wants to be heard. And if you don't let that voice be heard, they just get louder and louder or they kind of kick your body in the butt. Right. Yeah. How do you, what happens when you're not, if somebody's, you're, you're trying to say something and somebody's not paying attention? It's just a little bit of turning toward. It's a little bit of saying, honestly, this is what I'm experiencing. This is what's going on. And then talking to it, talking to it. You're trying to talk, panic. I see you. I feel you. Feels like a tightness. Feels like a thing. Hello. I get it. And that changes it. And also another thing is asking it to do more. When you ask it to do more, it, it all of a sudden feels a freedom and the energy dissipates. Oh my goodness, um, that's such a good one. That's so true because... Can, can I be more panicky? I wonder how much panic I can feel. How much fear can I feel? Could I be more afraid? Once you're empowered, you know it's a trick, essentially, that your body is playing on you, then yes, absolutely go there. And maybe, Ed, we have a lot of parents that listen and that have kids that experience panic attacks and I wonder if we can maybe help them with a role play. Sure, absolutely. So this is, you know, we do this every show and we 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 talk about acting it out and it's something, you know, this is something that you can do. Try these things out. It's not going to be perfect. It's going to get messy a little bit, but you play with it a little bit. So I will be I'll be a kid, I'll be a teen panicking about a test, okay? And Rini You'll be my mom and you will be, um, I guess the first thing is maybe we'll do it the way most people do it, which is to, I don't know what parent, what you tell your child when they're having this kind of attack, but you, this is without awareness. This is something that most parents would do. No tools, no interventions. 
um, I'm just having a panic attack, okay, about a test. Okay. And then we're going to do it with tools. And you'll tell them, we'll tell them the tools that we're using, and then we'll use them. Okay. So this is um, not just you worried, because you're not going to be able to do like a ton of speaking, because you're literally having a panic attack. Okay? Right. Okay. 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 <sighs> I can't. Hey, Eddie. Oh, I have a t I have a t Oh, no. Oh, no. Not again. Okay, listen. Can you do some deep breathing? You need to just, you need to just relax. You're going to be okay. Listen to me. I know, baby. I love you. Listen, I love you. You're going to be, it's fine. I wish you would do that breathing we learned the other day. Can you just do, take some deep breaths and calm down? Don't worry about it. All you have to worry about is that you're healthy and I'm healthy and dad's healthy and we're all healthy. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. How can I help you? Tell me what to do. Please, honey, calm down. You have to calm down. Look, please. Okay. Okay. So that is, that is with no tools and no awareness and no intervention. We're just in free fall there. Okay. So let's go back now. And let's go back. And now, Rini, mm -hmm. a couple of things that parents can do uh, for their kids. What are the what are a couple of tools, and then we'll you'll use them in our role play. So let's remember that the body is feeling that it's in danger. So repeating the words that you want your child to repeat. I know it's uncomfortable, but you're not in danger. You're safe, right? And keep it to short mantras. The brain has been hijacked, essentially, and the body. It's very hard for kids to interpret long pieces of logic at this point about why they shouldn't be panicking. So all you want to remind them is that you're there and they're safe. You know, and if you have talked about Trixie or the body playing tricks, it's just a trick. It's a false alarm. I'm here. You're safe. This is going to pass. This, you're uncomfortable. But, so short sentences and keep it simple. Okay. And they repeat it. They're supposed to repeat it. If they can repeat it. If they can't repeat it because of what they're experiencing, that's completely understandable. You practice that kind of repetition outside of the panic. So like anything, you know, I kind of think about it like taking a test. You wouldn't walk into a test hall without if you wanted to do well on the test and try to study right when you got in there, right? Because that wouldn't work. So this is the same thing. You have to practice outside of the event. But even without any practice, just kneeling down to their eye level and putting your hand on their back, if that's okay with them and letting them know that they're safe, that's even a step in the right direction. Okay. So you can practice this at other times when they're not experiencing this as sort of a, you know, sort of a, something that can help you uh, to do that. You can actually play it out. And if their kids are younger, they, they're more open to play and maybe you have a teenager. And uh, you can try it. You can try it. Or they can try it. Okay. So back, this is take two. This is with, t with the tool. And um, here we go. <sighs> oh. Eddie, oh, my goodness. Um, uh, I see what um, you're going through, baby. Uh, it's a panic attack. You're safe. What? I know it's uncomfortable. What? I'm here right uh, with you. What? You're safe. What? It's uncomfortable. It's not what? dangerous. I'm not, You're safe. I'm, not, I'm, but, I'm here. But what, but what? What? You're safe. What if I don't? I'm here. What if, I love you. I'm gonna. I'm gonna fail. I'm gonna fail the test. I won't be able to go. I won't be able to pass. You're uncomfortable I'm right now. I'm gonna fail it. It's uncomfortable. But you're yeah. safe. Yeah. It's uncomfortable. Oh. I'm here. You're safe. Oh. oh. I'm here. Oh. Okay. I'm okay. here. Your body was it's playing a trick on you. That was I'm panic. Safe. It's a trick. You're safe. Yes. Oh, it's a trick. You're safe. It's oh, a trick. That's a trick. You're safe. Okay. 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 I know that was uncomfortable, honey, but you were safe the whole time. I'm sorry that you went through that. Oh, wow. I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. I know that was hard. Wow, I can't, I couldn't breathe. I might. I know, I know. It can be scary, but I want you to know that when that happens to you, it's not dangerous. Okay? It's not dangerous. You're safe. It's just really uncomfortable. 
I know you are uncomfortable. I want you to try to remember that. And I know that's hard. I'm here to help you through it. Okay. 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 Sorry. Okay. So that's, you're, you're literally taught, you're talking to a child, you're talking to the panic. Talking to your child, you're talking to the panic, you're talking to yourself, because of course, when you see your child panic like that, you begin to panic. So, you know, really as a first grounding step, you have to know that they are uncomfortable, but they are not in danger. That's something that you need to be able to say to yourself mentally, so that you can step in and help because they need your guidance, or they just need you as a pillar of strength there near them. So you can, you're saying that you can do that simultaneously. This mantra is being used by two people at the same time. That's right. And if you want to be able to practice, because it's really hard to obviously emulate the conditions of panic, right? I mean, Ed's doing a great job, but Ed is also a seasoned actor and comedian, you know? So it, it can be hard to do it. But what you can do is you can do a little bit of exercise, right? So you can maybe run up and down the stairs or have your child run up and down the stairs So their heart is beating faster, right? So raise the respiratory heart rate up a little bit because that's what happens when you're panicking. And then you can do some role play, you know, sweat, get them to sweat a little bit, get them to be closer to the conditions of panic. So that way, if you want to do a role play and you want to practice, you're a little bit closer. Yeah. So you have them do jumping jacks or you have them do push-ups or you have them do something. It sounds ridiculous, right? But it works. Yeah, Yeah. Oh, but and and they'll go, you know, they'll go, they'll go along with it. But I, I cannot stress this enough. We're talking about panic now. You can use this phrase for any intense feeling or thought. Anyone. This is uncomfortable. It's not dangerous. And it's temporary. Try taking a breath and saying that to yourself. Oh, here it is again. Whoops, I was just going to avoid it. Oh, it's that thought. It's that feeling. It's uncomfortable. Feels uncomfortable. It's not dangerous. I'm not in danger. And it's temporary. And all of a sudden, it doesn't have that as much power. And you can make choices. You might take, make a choice and say, okay, I'm going to take a breath. Okay, I'm going to take a pause. Okay, I'm going to take a break. Okay, I'm going to take a walk. It could be anything. At any rate, I, I, I only say this because I experience these kinds of things with all, I may not be having a panic attack, but I am panicking about something that I'm thinking or feeling. Yes. I mean, I think the thing for me that's really, like if I had a highlighter that I would highlight just now that you said is you're taking some of its power away. You are, the feeling of powerlessness that you don't have any control to change your circumstances, that this is something that's happening to you. I mean, that is a key contributing factor to being depressed. Imagine something bad happening to you all the time and you have no power to change it. That's what panic attacks feel like. So this is putting you back in a place of power. This is putting you, your child, your family back in a place where you can actually do something about it. So as a parent, as a teen, I can practice this myself by how I talk to myself and what I say to myself when I'm having panic, I'm having thoughts, I'm having feelings that are uncomfortable. I can practice it in any moment at any time. You might have a mantra. You might have a word. It might not even be the whole sentence. It might be safe. It could be okay. It could be some, come some kind of shorthand. You might be having it in the middle of your work day. It's not, you may not be having a panic attack, but you are reacting to a thought or a feeling that you are having. You're doing something to it, about it. Usually it's avoiding or resisting. So that's that's a real simple tool. That's a simple thing. You can call it a trick. You can call it self-talk. You call it whatever you want. It can help you. I love that. I love boiling it down to one word because then you have that word and post that word around. And that word can be, you know, yeah, it's that word represents what we are talking about, that there's discomfort, but you're safe. And there might even be messaging within what the experience that you're going through. And there, of course, there are many other techniques that you can use. There are many Um, other techniques that you can use. This is the beginning. This is the beginning. That's right. Um, Well, you know, we actually have a program on our site for kids 
and it's called the Wave for Panic program. It's at gozen.com forward slash panic, where we go through a lot of that's, you know, so we're kind of scratching the surface with the cycle, but we go through the cycle with them. We go through that their body is playing a trick on them. And we go through many other techniques to help kids through panic. And the way we do that is, as Ed said earlier, through animation. So if you wanted to take a deeper dive into panic and really getting to know how to feel your feelings, that's a great one. I love that program. It's a little wacky too. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's really amazing. You've done, you've done so much. Uh, there's so much. There's also a, a program, uh, there was a, a, a training that was sort of done for parents. And it's, I see it's called Panic, Bring It On. Yes. Yes. Because, you know, a lot of times parents will say, oh, my goodness, I'm experiencing the same thing as my child or I have experienced the same thing. And then there's the wondering, did I pass it on to them? And I always say this, you know, when there's that question, which is maybe, you know, there are a lot of a lot of times they, you know, if you look into the research on panic, they will essentially say it's inconclusive. We're not exactly sure, but there could be a lot of elements and one of those could be familial or genetic and maybe there's some, in, you know, environmental stuff going on and maybe there's some learned behavior going on. But at the end of the day, the why for me is not as important, but the how and how do we transform this? And so we do. Yeah, we have something called Panic Bring It On, which is for grownups, for parents. Um, and then we also have Wave for Panic. So again, that's if you just go to gozen.com forward slash panic, you will see that. Um, and then all this stuff is always on our podcast page, which is gozen.com forward slash dear anxiety. But what, you know, we are on iTunes now. Do we want to talk a little bit about that, Ed? Absolutely. Yeah, we're on iTunes and uh, you can find us at bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash dear anxiety on iTunes. You can subscribe there. You can find out more about the podcast. My personal panic is there, <laughs> and you can experience that for yourself. And it's kind of entertaining to because it's not yours; it's mine. And you can you can experience it and tell me that I, I'm okay and that it's not dangerous, and maybe it'll get through to me. Yeah, and we really want iTunes and Apple and any of the other podcast services that we're on. So we're on Google Play, we're on Stitcher. We're on iTunes or on YouTube, you know, but we would love for you guys to drop us a comment. If you like what you hear, drop us a review because we want them to know that mental health matters and we want to reach as many parents, educators, therapists, and kids as possible. So thank you so much for helping with that. And this is another thing that usually we, we start every show and we end every show with uh, a, a child or a teen talking about their experience of the subject that we're talking about today. It was panic. You heard this uh, at just now at the top of the show. And we, we end every show uh, with a little bit of advice also from uh, a child or a teen. If you want, if you can, if you have questions, if you have comments, if you have struggles that you want to share, or if your child wants to share their issue that they're having, you can record it on your phone and then send it to us and we'll play it on the show. Uh, how do they do that, Rainy? Where do they send those, those submissions? Gozen.com forward slash dear anxiety. You will see the submission form. Okay. Thanks, everybody. And, and we go out, uh, as we do always, with uh, you're going you're gonna to hear uh, a child uh, giving some advice about panic. Keep coming back. It works if you work it. We'll see you next week right here on Dare Anxiety. Your worry is just an emotion. I mean, it might like kick up your nerves or instincts or something, but it's not going to affect anything physical. Like it's not going to hurt you. And some of the things you worry about, like say you worry about global warming or something, you can't control that either. Most things that you worry about, you can't control, so you just have to calm yourself. And just writing things down kind of just helps you, like, keep your head straight and clarify with yourself. And take deep breaths. Loosen your muscles, and hopefully that'll help. Taking deep breaths just helps so much. That's what I do when I'm anxious. I just forget my surroundings. 
It's almost like meditation. Feeling weak, it's just, it's not real. It's still just an emotion. If you're not weak, you're strong. Just think that to yourself.